left, who is a um, true official title with Echoes and uh, trainer. He's a trainer. Yes. Echoes and <laughs> Spectrum, which is really funding this program, essentially. They, they flew him here from Arizona, and uh, they provide all the material. You'll hear a lot about what's available. As you probably already know, there's an incredible amount of material uh, online and in other ways on this whole area. You'll hear more about the Echoes, U.S. Holocaust Museum. Um, anyway, so Kim is from Echoes and Reflection. She is a high school teacher, but she's also a, a very experienced trainer for Echoes and Reflection, and um, has been at the um, fellow with the U.S. Holocaust Museum, right? Yes. Yeah. And um, what else? Um, that's good. That's good. <laughs> all over the country doing this kind of training. Right. So very experienced, and I think you'll really uh, learn a lot from her and learn from each other. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here, and thank you for having me. I know it's hard sometimes to get away from school. Um, you got me out of school today, so thank you. <laughs> I've already had yesterday, I think, five emails from my students. What do I do on this paper? Um, so anyway, I'm glad to be here. I had got a few funny looks yesterday when I got off the plane with sandals on. My shoes, my shoes are not uh, Rhode Island and Massachusetts appropriate, but that's okay. So I thought we would start by um, looking at ourselves for a minute. And so I'm gonna have you just do kind of a, a quick shout out. I'll model what I want you to do because we're going to be looking at a specialty program that Echoes and Reflections does. How many of you, by the way, have been to an Echoes and Reflections training ever before? Okay, so this one's very different. Echoes and Reflections typically does what we call the signature program where we show how to use the website, we feature a, let, a unit or two, do some activities with you to show you how to use it. If you've not used it before, I will show you eventually how, how to get there. We're going to be going back and forth between the PowerPoint and between the website itself so that you should leave today feeling pretty comfortable using it. But we also have specialty programs. So this is one of them, looking at immigration in the 1930s and connecting, not comparing, but connecting to the refugee crisis today. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. So I thought that we would start by, again, thinking about our own backgrounds. Um, I've done this in class before. And I want you to think about your background, where your family came from. All right, so for example, my name is Kim. And my background is mostly Irish, German, and a little bit of Native American. Okay, so that's what you're going to do nice and loudly as we go around the room. So I'm going to start way in the back. Yes, hello. Hi, good morning. My name is Justine Curry, and my background is uh, Hungarian, Russian, German, Irish. Nice. And then back here. Uh, my name is Tom Lavera. My, uh, my background is Italian and Irish. Okay. My name is Kyle Francoeur. My background is Scottish. Justin Charest, uh, mostly French Canadian. Okay. Kevin Mahoney, Irish from Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> New York, a whole different ballgame. <laughs> Paul Rivello, uh, Ancestry.com tells me 87% Portuguese, 5% Spanish, a little bit of Irish, and less than 2% black. Which is okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, <laughs> the things we learned from ancestry, right? <laughs> Here. Uh, Nick Santos, uh, Azorian, and German and Irish. Uh, Mike Furtado, I'm uh, Portuguese and Polish. Mm -hmm. Gary Sullivan, I'm Irish and French. Nathan Norrie, mostly English. Mm -hmm. uh, John Morrison, I am Russian, Scottish, a little bit of French, some Native American, and English. I am Karen Ginsburg, my background is Russian and Romanian. Thank <laughs> you. 
I'm going to come down here. I'll get back over here. Go uh, ahead, here. Carol Foster, uh, Swedish, Danish, Italian. Learn a little bit of Polish, Russian. Uh, okay. So I love doing this in my classroom, and I'll have some kids who are like, I don't know, and that's okay. They can pass if they don't know or if they're uncomfortable in any, for any reason. But what does this help us see? Right? Mostly local. We're all immigrants. Anything else? We're a global community. We represent a global community. Yeah. Look at all the... It'd be cool to have a map up and you know yeah. put little markers or something on it. Yeah. What else? Anything else we learned from that? Yeah. The lessons you could use the students to connect connect to. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's cool too to see that we might have something in common, right? That some of us might have a similar background that we wouldn't necessarily see, you know, by looking at the person that could be a connector. So I like to do that early in the year. Um, and just find out, again, where my students are from, what their backgrounds are, what they know about it, what they might want to know. So anyway, just kind of an icebreaker, no test on that later, I promise. Um, so looking at Echoes and Reflections real quickly, Echoes has been around since 2005. Um, I've used it in my classroom since then and then became a trainer later. Um, but it's an excellent program that, what I love about it too is that they're always developing, they're always building on what they have. So they don't get complacent and just say, okay, this is it. Um, they're always growing and developing. And so this refugee program came about a few years ago. Um, it's my favorite one to present. I'm really interested in this topic. We also have a program, if you teach the book Night, that is a three to five hour program where we'll come out and show you how to use some of our supplementary, supplementary t materials with that book. So really good, tried and true um, resources, primary source materials, uh, video testimony, all kinds of great things that you can use with this. Um, if you're interested, we come out, somebody like myself or I will come out and do a program in schools, in districts, in regions, Anything where you can get 20 to 25 teachers together will come out for free. Um, there's no place to pay for anything on our website because we don't charge. Um, we have some donors who, when they developed this years ago, they wanted every high school and junior high student to learn about the Holocaust. And that they, they knew that in order to do that, they needed to provide resources to teachers. And again, they wanted to do that for free. Um, and by coming to the training, you know, you can go to the website. It's really easy to use. You don't have to register or anything. But, you know, sometimes we hear about a website and we go home and, yeah, I'll look at it later. I'll look at it over the summer. And we never get to it. And so when you come to a workshop and you see the great lessons and plans and resources that are on it, it kind of gets you a little more motivated to maybe go back and try that. Um, like Ron said, I teach English. Um, I have a, it was a semester long class called Holocaust Literature. Last year it developed to year long. Okay, are you guys okay with my, can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, let me know if you can't, but um, thank you. Um, so anyway, that's kind of how I come into it. How many of you are social studies teachers? Show of hands. Yeah, how many English or language arts? Okay. that's typically flipped in a lot of the conferences that we do um, because we're finding that English teachers have more time in the classroom to, to do this work. Um, but either way, we have, you know, again, this is um, meant for high school, junior high, middle school, and for social studies or for English. Um, our three partners are the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, 
um, the USC Shoah Foundation, which provides our, vid our videos, um, our testimonies, and then also the uh, Yad Vashem, the museum in, in Jerusalem. So those are our partners. So we're going to start by looking at this letter from April 30th, 1941. Does someone want to read the first paragraph? Yes, thank you. <coughs> Dear Charlie, I was forced to look out for immigration as far as I can see USA is the only country we can go to. Perhaps you remember that we have two girls and it's for the sake of the children mainly that we have to care for. Our own fate is, but is of less importance. Two brothers of heaven emigrated last year and they work as ordinary workmen around Boston. Both of them earn money but not enough to have us come. They would be able to give an affidavit for their mother living with us here, and they saved. Should enough, be saved, yeah. Uh, they saved enough for uh, enough as far as I can make out to pay the passage for my mother. Okay. Who'd like to read the second paragraph? Thank you. Uh, in 1938, I filed an application in Rotterdam to emigrate to the USA, but all the papers have been destroyed there. The dates of application are of no importance any longer, as everyone who has an accepted affidavit from a member of his family and who can pay his passage may leave. One says that no special difficulty shall be made from the part of the German authorities, but in the case that an affidavit from family members is not available or not sufficient, the consul asks a bank deposit. How much he would ask in my case, I don't know. I am not allowed to go to Rotterdam, and without an introduction, the consul would not even accept me. As far as I hear from other people, it might be about $5,000 for us four. You are the only person I know that I can ask. Would it be possible for you to give me a deposit in my favor? Okay. So what's, what's the focus of this letter? What's he asking? Sponsorship and money. Yeah, sponsorship and money help get us, get us out of here, get us to the US, right? Anything else that stands out to you about the letter? Yeah. If you have enough money, you can get out. Right, so this sense that money possibly could be a factor. And this is 1941, 5,000, I mean 5,000 is a lot today, right? Um, it, $5,000 in their Currency today would be about eighty-five thousand dollars. Yeah, so that's that's a that's a chunk of change that most people don't have sitting around just to you know to give, right? Yeah. Well, he mentions Rotterdam, doesn't he? Have any ideas who this is who wrote this letter? It's a man. It's a man. Right? Forever. Empresses. Mm -hmm. Is it all Frank? It is. You have a copy in your folders, um, in the back of your folders. You have a copy of this letter that you could use with your students. I've used this one. And yes, it's a letter from Otto Frank, the two daughters, the wife, Edith. There are some hints. You mentioned Holland, right? So there are some hints for us there. And I want to give you just a couple of clarifications with this um, particular letter. First of all, as you mentioned, the war had already started. It's 1941. And some, sometimes, again, depending on where my students are in their knowledge of the history, they might say, well, gosh, he's writing kind of late. You know, like why would he wait this long to, um, to ask for help and to try to get out of the country? What we have to remember is as far as, as being in Holland at this point, things hadn't gotten too awful, right? Um, he had his business, he had his family there, they felt relatively safe. I'm sure it's important to note that they had left Frankfurt. Exactly. So they yes. already made one huge change. Yes. And started the business again. Right. The second time. And you don't want to move. Third time. Exactly. And, it, and if you don't have to, again, if you're not feeling that pressure, you, you don't want to uproot. The first time. Right. When did they come to from Germany to Holland? Do we remember? I'm finding my students haven't read Anne Frank's diary anymore. 
They're, they've gotten away from that, yeah. I used to be able to assume, you know, and I mentioned it this year. I said something about Anne Frank, and I got these blank stares. And I said, you guys read that still, right? What are you talking about? Yeah, so I've kind of had to explain a lot this year. Um, but yeah, so they came over in 19, or sorry, went to Amsterdam in 1933. Um, and they actually went because of anti-Semitism. Uh, Margo was in, I believe, first grade at that time, and she had been segregated in her classroom already in 1933, and they'd also heard some Hitler Youth outside of their home um, and heard some, some singing and such that made them uncomfortable. Again, Otto, though, had connections there. He'd been there 10 years previously, and it was, you know, he felt comfortable. He knew the language. Uh, he had business connections. He, he felt comfortable in doing that. We're going to be talking today about that push and pull of immigration, right? So the push for them were those anti-Semitic acts that they were starting to notice. The pull was the fact that they had, he had business connections and could make a living there and, and felt fairly comfortable there. Um, a couple of other things that I wanted to mention about the letter is that um, there's going to be in the U.S., which is going to make this a little more difficult for him, there's going to be a, a review system for people coming in. And they made it difficult because one of the things that it's very vague is that they had to, you had to prove that the person coming would add a positive benefit. Well, how do you define that, right? What does that mean? A positive benefit. So that would have been difficult. Um, the man he's writing to, he calls him Charlie. It's a nickname. It's Nathan Strauss. Nathan Strauss was the son of one of the co-owners of Macy's department stores. So he certainly had some money. Um, he also was, he headed the U.S. Housing Authority. So I like to point that out to my students because, again, this guy had connections, but he couldn't get them over still, right? So it's not always because you have money or because you have some connections. That can help, certainly, but it doesn't always fully allow that to happen. Um, Otto had had some opportunities. They had a cousin in England who offered to take the girls. Again, he didn't want to split up the family. Understandable. I have to always remind my students they don't know the end of the story. We do, right? Do yeah. Know, when did he have the opportunity to go to England? It was, I want to say around 38. Mm -hmm. He had applied, by the way, for uh, a, a quota number, but again, it was after, it, I think it was in 38, and he wasn't able, you know, too many people were trying to get out at that point. Yeah, exactly. If by 41, he's getting desperate. He also had recently been blackmailed um, because he had been talking about, all he said was something about he didn't think the Germans were going to win quickly, like everybody you know, was saying. And he mentioned that to somebody who worked for him who then reported it to her husband, who reported it to the Gestapo. He got a letter blackmailing him, and that's when he wrote this letter. So yeah, there's that desperation. And again, it's later in the game, and he knows it's getting more difficult. Yes? Do we know what steps Strauss took to get to the United States? We don't, uh, or I don't at least. Um, I know, like I said, that he did make some attempts, but it was not successful. Yeah. He had worked in the United States, he did as well. Otto Frank had? Okay. Yeah, so I mean, there's another benefit, right? Um, he mentions Rotterdam and his papers being destroyed there. That's because it was bombed, right? And so um, the, the papers, very likely that he had um, filed, again, definitely would have been affected by that. I also want to mention that they, um, the, the idea of people becoming a public charge came about during this time, and we're hearing that again. Um, in fact, there was a, a rule, I guess, that was supposed to take place starting October 15th, just a few weeks ago. Um, and so that's a term that we're hearing again. Um, 
during this time in 1938. Oh, okay. Is this good? Are you guys okay without it? Yeah. Yeah, they're saying they're okay without it. So. <laughs> Sorry. But thank you. Thank you. I'll, I might use it later. My voice might get weaker <laughs> as we go here. Just in case. Okay. Um, yes. There we go. There we go. Perfect. There we go. Good idea. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Good idea. Um, in 1938 and 1939, um, according to public opinion polls, 95% of Americans disapproved of the German regime, and yet fewer than 9% supported changing the system to allow more refugees into the country. Right, so you get this imbalance as well that's at work, and we're going to look at some more polls like that as well. Um, just to give you an idea of the paperwork, so he's writing this letter in 1941, by 1943, the visa application was four feet in length. It was double-sided, so that'd make it eight feet in length. I like to mention that to my students because it gives them that visual, right, of wow, that's a lot of paperwork. And a lot of it, we'll, we'll look at the, the requirements and such, but a lot of it had to be, you know, in triplicate, in, and this is before copy machines, right? So a lot of obstacles put in the way um, for them. Um, I think that's all I needed to go over that. Any other thoughts or questions that you have on Otto Frank's letter? Okay. Yes, sorry. Yes. Would it, the job is to take them through the kit to transport? Was that, how, was that what his plan was? No, his plan is, is to get the whole family to the U.S. No, but you had said it was a possibility. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, there was a cousin, not the kinder transport, oh, but there was a cousin who said that she would take the girls. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly, so similar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that coming up as well. Yes, okay. So keeping this in mind and making those connections, um, looking at the end of World War II, 60 million people were displaced during and after the war, 60 million. Seven to nine million displaced persons at the end of the war, about 250,000 were Jewish. And I should mention with these, because I see a lot of you writing these down, which is good because these are not on our website, these slides. Um, so if you want to take pictures, that's fine, or write it down, not a problem at all. They just don't have this one. It's not a unit or anything. So if you do want any of these figures, jot those down. Um, looking at the end of 2018, that number surpasses that. I believe it was around 2015 that it started to surpass. So now 70.8 million people displaced worldwide and 29.4 million refugees and asylum seekers. And so again, this gets back to that rationale of why we're looking at this. There are these connections. And by looking and trying to understand the past, it can give us some information to help us deal with this huge issue today as well. Yeah. Uh, so 70.8 million and then 2018 displaced as a result of war? War, um, for the Just most part. General. Conflicts, yes. And then right, refugees and asylum seekers. Yeah. Okay. Ban Ki Moon, who um, between 2007 and 2016 was the UN Secretary General, in 2016 said, We are facing the biggest refugee and displacement crisis of our time. Above all, this is not just a crisis of numbers, it is also a crisis of solidarity. What does he mean by solidarity, do you suppose? Yeah. So that's solidarity that's in taking, in in taking refugees. Yeah. Just solidarity in terms of humanity. In terms of humanity. 
Yes. I think the reference is meant to invoke uh, the strength of the United Nations, to be honest. But how, how strong, the strength of the members is the strength of the unit. And if the unit isn't strong, um, where, where are we yeah. as, as a world? Did everybody hear that OK? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who would be your lovely assistant? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ron. I appreciate that. Yes. I think also, um, in looking at what you're saying about the United Nations, we also have to look at the rise of nationalism that's going on in the world sure. today. And that kind of is what he said in a different context. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. If you go back to the slide before this, mm -hmm. which I think is important, mm -hmm. the one on the left, those were Europeans. Right. On the right, they're not white Europeans. Right. Yes. That's a big difference. Great point. And you have to keep that in mind. These mm -hmm. are not, you know, and even that at the end of World War II, people didn't like that. Mm -hmm. They didn't like the peace. Right. They didn't like that. It was looked down upon. They, like they were Jewish. Mm -hmm. Now, you're talking about a whole different type of refugee and asylum seeker. Mm -hmm. And even that on the left was not treated by everybody nicely. Right. It was allowed, but. Mm -hmm. So that's an important difference mm -hmm. today. And also right. But it, it, not that it should be, but it right. is. Right, but it is. It and is, a, absolutely. A whole, just to be back on that, a whole bunch of different reasons to dislike the CPs. Any other thoughts? Though, yeah. Is it? Do people still feel the same way they did back in World War II? We just see it now in social media. We mm -hmm. see it more, especially on our mind. It's kind of like I reflect back in the past and my childhood being great and wonderful, but in reality, it kind of wasn't. You know what I mean? <laughs> that kind of idea. Right. So I think a lot of the same problems. And again, the people on the left and the right, people don't want anybody. It's like George Collins came up with the idea back in the day about NIMBY, not my backyard. Right. So we have all these great delusions of having all these great programs and everything, just not in my right. house. Yeah. So I think a lot of it over time, we've kind of forgotten about how distasteful people were back then to immigrants. In the 1890s, I was in New York. My family came in. Mm -hmm. They want any Irish to be not apply. The yeah. Irish people got all the horrible jobs, to put, you know, sure. the things that nobody wanted to do. And it's kind of changed over the years. So whoever the newest group is, is one that nobody wants. Mm -hmm. And the fact that religion is a big factor of it, and Muslim and all that stuff, I think that's why in the right, people are so dissatisfied. And they love blaming all their problems on somebody else. Right. But I think they did the same thing back then, too. Oh, yeah. Um, and I think that goes to what you were saying about the way that the Jewish refugees were looked. Um, down upon in many places. Yeah. So, it's, it's, so just to comment on your point, these were others. Right. right? It's, the, it's the other, the, yeah. the group of others, right? So whether it be Irish Catholic, whether it be Jews, whether it be um, African, whether it be some other non white, it's these are viewed as others. Right. Others. <laughs> <laughs> And maybe that's where that idea of solidarity too, right? Goes. Yeah, I, think he, I think he's referring to there's no global consensus on right. how to get to the heart of these areas or these issues where there might be violence or warfare or people migrating. The global community is not on the same page. No. With, as he says, morally, we, we kind of might be, but, but uh, politically, 
I think he's referring to. Well, and it goes back to, again, that public poll, right? So that people didn't like what the Germans were doing and yet didn't want to take people in either. Um, I'm going to go here and then over here. Yes? So, actually, in relation to that poll, uh, that poll was taken after the start of World War II, right? Right. So, do you think, like, because that poll was taken after that a lot of people who, because, like, you know, like, historically speaking, there was quite a few, and it's not something that we talked about, but there was quite a bit of support for Germany. Uh, oh, sure. For some people, like mm -hmm. more than 5% mm -hmm. uh, before World War II began. It was right. after that, that, so, like, potentially what I would say is, like, probably some people were definitely maybe lying on that poll. Oh, sure. Fudging the numbers. Sure. And we know that happens. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Mm -hmm. I think it goes back to why the League of Nations was created and therefore why the UN was created. Mm -hmm. This was created to stop conflict. Mm -hmm. And if it can't do its job to stop conflict, why is there a refugee crisis? Because of conflict. Mm -hmm. So if you stop the conflict, you stop the refugee crisis. Right. Yeah. I have, I have built an off of that. Um, maybe, I don't know, yeah, like political book, the UN, like the leading members of the UN Security Council, they take global policy, uh, statistically are the world's leading arms exporters, um, mm -hmm. fueling these conflicts. Mm -hmm. So, I, mean, I think that's probably like, the main issue. Well, the worst issue. abuses of human rights. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Like, for example, Saudi Arabia. Right. Yeah. Given yeah, the head of the Human Rights Committee. All of, all of the above, <laughs> yes. Absolutely. So, this was in 2015. Um, then Speaker Paul Ryan said, we cannot allow terrorists to take advantage of our compassion. This is a moment where it is better to be safe than sorry. Okay. Um, now, first of all, I will tell you that uh, Echoes and Reflections doesn't get real political because we want you to use this in the classroom. My kids have no clue who Paul Ryan even was or is. So, you know, I don't have to really worry too much about that. But um, you're going to see that we pair them with others, okay, so just in case anybody's thinking it's going that way. Um, do we know what Paul Ryan was referring to? Yes? I think Syrian refugees. You're on the right track? Uh-huh. He was, he said this after a specific event. And unfortunately in our world, because there's like an event every day it feels like, it's hard to remember. Which one? Was it the Arab Spring? No. Which was later found to be false, right? ISIS uh, claimed responsibility for all of this, but this was his response to it. And we hear this a lot throughout history, right? This fear of who might come in if we let others in. If we go back to 1940, FDR said, now, of course, the refugee has got to be checked because, unfortunately, among the refugees, there are some spies. Right? There was fear of the fifth column. There was fear of you know, who might be coming in with these refugees. Yes? Uh, the fear was exaggerated, but there yes. were certain elements. I mean, that has to be kind of, of course. remembered. I mean, there were um, communist Moscow spies. Right. Um, at this time, and also too, um, Germany's facing it today. They're actually uncovering um, war criminals amongst refugees. So, I mean, it's like a small portion, right? But there is some legitimacy, right? But it's blown out. Exactly, exactly. And so, and that, and that's what happens with the fear, right? that one thing happens or, or we hear about one issue and then that blows up our fear even more so, right? And so there is a sense of the fear. I wanted to read a quote, I don't have it up here. Um, there was uh, an author named Max Paul Friedman who wrote a book called Nazis and Good Neighbors and he believed that, quote, the fear was genuine but misplaced. That is, none of the Jewish refugees who arrived in the U.S. has ever been found to have done anything in the interest of the Nazis. They fled them. They didn't want to help them. Right? So again, I, I thought that was a really interesting response um, to that. We can even look at later, um, after the war, I don't know, have any of you seen the book called The Nazis Next Door? Um, 
No, it's a, it's a different one. I can't remember the author's name, but it's how we literally let Nazis in to help us fight communism and such, right? Yeah, and it's, it's incredibly interesting. Yeah. Yes, exactly. He, he addresses that in the book as well. Yeah. So looking from a, a, a psychological point as a refugee for the next um, couple of quotes, this is a survivor of the kinder transport. Um, if you teach the topic, this is an excellent resource. It's a documentary called Into the Arms of Strangers. Um, she said, to be a refugee is the most horrible feeling because you lose your family. You lose your home. You're also without an identity. Suddenly, you are a nothing. You are just reliant on other people's good nature and help and understanding. Any thoughts on that? I'll, I'll turn this way, soon, but I'm talking to you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm going to turn this way. Um, all of us have had um, immigrants in our family, as you can tell. All of us have. So there's a difference in your mind, or probably our mind should be, a difference between a refugee and an immigrant. Yes. I would say most of our immigrant ancestors came here willingly for mostly job, you know, right. economically they were not, couldn't do anything in Europe, so they came here and were able to own homes or land or whatever. A refugee seems to be different. It is. And so maybe the understanding between an immigrant and a refugee yes. should be explained to me yes. that way. We will, there's a sheet with definitions that we're gonna to get to that's in your folder. Yeah, you're just a step ahead of me. Yes, no worries, no worries. But you're right, that, that there is this sense of fear and having to rely on others, right? And we could still see that within immigration, right? That it can be tough. But yeah, it's, it is a different level, I would say, for refugees. Yes? Two points, I mean, it's written by somebody who that was obviously forced to go to England as a kinder transport, so they're the child. I think you have to put it into context that this is from a child's point of view. Right. So that sense of identity yes. is being ripped away from them as a child. They haven't had family to uh, teach that identity. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a little, I think a refugee that is a child and a refugee that is an adult, there's a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and talking about refugees versus an immigrant, even as an immigrant personally, um, you feel like you're stuck between two worlds. Mm -hmm. You're easily marked as an immigrant because of your accent, yet when you go back to your home country, you become Americanized. So there's right. always that never really fitting in. Yeah. So that's when you've decided to make that choice, but not having actively made that choice. <coughs> it's something that psychologically is really hard to deal with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important to make that distinction, like you said, the child and adult. Because you're right, it would be two very different experiences. And the way that you view that, it would be a different lens. Yeah, good point. This is a woman named Deline. She's a Burundian refugee and survivor, and she gave testimony in a Tanzanian refugee camp in 2016. She says, a refugee is a person who does not have any options. A refugee's life is reliant only on help. I don't feel good being a refugee. We don't have a good place to live. If I had a good place to live, I would have some peace back in my life. And I think this really goes back to that idea that a refugee doesn't have choices. Where So you were saying like with an immigrant, you choose, right, to usually um, to go somewhere else but, um, for maybe better opportunities. But the refugee doesn't have a choice. Um, I work with an organization in Phoenix called the Welcome to America Project. And every Saturday they go out and welcome three recently arrived refugee families and bring you know, furniture and donations and such to them. And um, I just was doing it last week and we had a 16 year old girl. And of course our first question was, well do you like school and you know, do you like it here? And she hesitated and so I knew she doesn't like it here. Right, but she didn't want to say that and seem ungrateful. And I said, tell us the truth, you know, it's, it's okay. And she said, yeah, I, I really just don't like it here. It's, it's too hot, 
it was still 95 degrees this week in Phoenix, you know, and I get it. I don't like it all the time either. Um, you know, and so it's, it's, it's such a, a shock and such a change, and they don't choose where they get to go. You know, so they apply um, for that asylum and, and then to come to the United States, and they don't get any say. Where were they from? Uh, she was from the Congo. Yeah, Democratic Republic of Congo. And so it's, you know, quite a bit. They go from, you know, lush jungle areas and, and to, the, to the desert, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it is pretty atrocious sometimes. Also, yeah. Again, I'm talking to you, but I'll turn around so you can hear me. Yes. Most of our immigrant families, I assume when they came from Europe, they went to some sort of family members. You know, even if it was an aunt or uncle or I, I, I don't know. You know, they came, they came from Portugal or they came from Italy or whatever, but someone had to sponsor them and they, mm -hmm. there would have been people from their village or people that were relatives back in the day. Right. Before 1924 when they shut it off. Yes. So there might have been a familiar language or a familiar, right. even if it was in a different temperature zone, there was a familiar. Yes. Was that, am I yes. Yeah, I think so, for a lot. I think so, yeah. Okay. Well, one of, one of the things I talk to my students about in terms of when we talk about immigration is, and I have a lot of immigrant students in the you know, first generation uh, immigrant students in my class who mm -hmm. talk about just those things, right? Um, you know, an immigrant may have more options than a refugee, mm -hmm. but in most cases, they don't. Like, the, the push factors mm. that get them to leave their home country are so intense that it is sort of a forced. Oh, it's uh, not it's, the same as yeah, it was. It's, it's not, I mean, you know, it's not the same thing in any way, shape, or form, but you're still, I mean, you talk to the students and like, if you had your choice, where would you right. be? And they'd be home, yeah. they would be in their home nation. Yeah. And they, you know, are looking at all these factors that sort of contribute to their discomfort and just say, hey, I would not be there. I try to just say, if immigrants leave their country, it's for like really serious reasons. Like people don't just pick up one day and say, hey, I'm gonna leave Cape Verde and come to the United States because we want to. Right. You know, it's like you're leaving everything that you know and yeah. you still this sort of, even, even if it's like a, a subtle force if there's something pushing. Something yeah, pushing. you're right. Exactly. All right. So if you have your phone um, handy and want to try this out, do you guys use Menti at all, Mentimeter? I've been playing with it this year. Um, if you go to menti.com, it will ask you for a code. And it's 23882. You don't have to put the spaces in. And what I want you to do is it's going to give you two spots to put in a word. And I want you to think about just so far today or with your prior knowledge, um, how would you describe the experience of a refugee? No, you don't need the spaces. Yeah, that working. is weird. Is it not working? Okay. I, I set it up and played with it and it was working for me, darn it. Well, let's just do a shout out then. What are some words that come to mind of the refugee experience so far? Well, one of the experiences, you know, that I observed when I was a practicing attorney is the conflict between the parents and the children, because the children become too Americanized. Oh, you know, yeah. So you have an enormous <clears throat> conflict, and it varies in families on how destructive it can become. Sure. So conflicts even after they escape con other right. conflicts, right, right. within I the think family. It's more frequent with girls than it is with boys. Um, but my experience in Fall River is a fairly substantial community of Cambodians that were refugee camps. Mm -hmm. And that you find in the families, like one particular family I was involved with, the 
father was a philosophy professor. I forget what, you know, the mom was stay at home. The girl was brilliant, but she was becoming more, you know, Americanized. Mm -hmm. And um, there was enormous, you know, conflict in the family. Right. Uh, the other family had a, two bright boys. One just started to do some gangs in Fall River. And what was interesting about the gangs in Fall River is they were interracial as opposed mm -hmm. to how they are in the Bedford, which I think is really interesting. If I was a sociologist, I would want to write a report on that, but I don't have the skills <laughs> to do that. And he kept like, getting into trouble. And, and, and his older brother ended up you know, working for Google. So you have these kinds of conflicts. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. and, and, and in the Cambodian community, what, what I found was a lot of the parents were educated. Um, and I had a friend who actually was in a tent, and they come into the tent, take a, the parents and her older brother, she gets some gunshots, so she never sees them again. Right. And she ended up becoming a social worker. So you see a lot of that in Fall River, mm -hmm. which I think is interesting. Well, interesting might not be the appropriate word. But. Oh, I think it is, yeah. Any other words? So conflict is one that we would put on it. Health care is very different from country to country. Sure. And a lot of the Cambodians, that was having a woman be examined by a male doctor was not allowed. Right. And so yeah, there was a lot of trouble. And so maybe even country. just adaptation, mm -hmm. right, in that sense, whether it's for health care or foods. Right, that's something that I hear a lot is that, ooh, the food. Right, the other thing you had to deal with if you were a therapist, you had to, you had to understand the culture that the people came from. Mm -hmm. You know, like indigenous Americans, because I had a very close friend, she would speak to her dead parents. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to a therapist, you know, that's kind of wacky. That's part of the Cambodian heritage mm -hmm. also. And I remember with a therapist, I found an article and I gave it to therapist so she would understand that's not a sign of mental illness that's the culture yeah so culture would be enough because when you go to mentee you can choose to make a word cloud which is what I was going to do with this um, and so as people populate it the words that are more populated get bigger of course and so yeah so culture and adaptation and conflict right are some of the words what's another one fear uncertainty fear uncertainty way in the back distrust distrust yeah and when you mention the camps that people are in a lot of times people don't realize that the refugees coming over have been in camps for maybe even 18 or 20 years right um, the the Congolese family I was telling you about had five kids three of them had been born in the camps right we visited another Congolese family where all the ch all the children were younger they'd all been born in camps they knew nothing else so talk about that shock right and that fear of, of just you know things that we take for granted how about um, and this may be your expectation perhaps of the adults for their children mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. a lot of times it's, it's around education and that might go back to those conflicts exactly. Right. The conflict that's there, the children may or may not want to do that. Sure. Or they may become their education, but they don't want to go back to the country after they get that education because they're more Americanized. Right. So that would be culture change. Yeah. And well, conflict. conflict. And conflict. You know, not to be derogatory, maybe I can say because I'm Jewish. You know, I consider them to do Jews because they really emphasize education with their kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really important. They didn't want their kids to end up in the factory place. They did it. They wanted their kids to be educated. And in my experience, and that worked fairly successful. I mean, the conflict they had was the girls being dating and other the clothes they wore and who their friends mm -hmm. were. Um, because in Cambodia, you know, it was more structured in what you can do. You know, and the boys, you know, that they wanted to hang around with who was around their neighborhood. And it right. wasn't always a good choice. So I wanted to add, um, sorry, this looks awful. I just threw them in there real quickly. But a few uh, suggested readings. Uh, the Children of Lesden Lane is a great book on the kinder transport. I have used that in my classroom. 
Um, I highly recommend it. There's a teacher's guide online for it. It's very readable. They also have a young readers version. So if you have like sixth or seventh graders, you might want to use the young readers version. Uh, the author, Mona Golubek, is, um, her, her mother was a um, product of the kinder transport, and so she tells her mother's story. She also, if you have a lot of money in your community and want to bring her, she'll come out. Um, she came to Phoenix. We raised a lot of money. Our Phoenix Holocaust Survivors Association raised it, and she put on this beautiful one-woman show where she plays, she's a concert pianist, as her mother was, and she plays the piano and tells her mother's story, um, and there, you know, there's visuals, and it's, it's very effective. My students absolutely loved it. Um, if we're looking at um, other um, groups of refugees, The Girl Who Smiled Beads is about a woman from Rwanda. Um, and Clementine Wamaria is the author of that. She also does some speaking engagement. She has a great TED Talk that I've used with my students called The Power of One Word, where she talks about the word genocide and all the faults with it, right, that she, that she just doesn't agree with. Excellent book. Um, Nadia Murad wrote, uh, she won the Nobel Peace Prize last year, uh, was one of two winners, and she wrote a book called The Last Girl. She's Yazidi out of Iraq and um, has been persecuted for her religion. She was kidnapped by ISIS and made one of their so-called brides and um, horrible things happened to her and so she's written this very brave memoir of that. Um, a recent book that came out that goes along with the, all the talk we're doing with the refugee crisis in the 30s is called The Unwanted by Michael Dobbs. Um, he recently spoke at USHMM and um, it's an excellent book because it has a lot of the information that we've been using in this PowerPoint with just the background and the history and such of the, um, the, the quota system and you know, all the issues in getting to another place. But he also pairs it with a um, one family. And so you're following this family through the book and finding out what happens to them. So it makes it a little more personal, narrowing it down to that story. And then um, a plug for one of our museum teacher fellows, Jennifer Craig Norton, wrote a book called The Kinder Transport that just came out this year. And um, I haven't read it yet, but I've heard really good things about it. She's a really solid researcher so um, and lives in England now and, and um, did a lot of that study. So just some ideas as we're thinking about what we might want to look at more. And there are lots of other options as well. So I just wanted to go back real quickly to our goals um, and just kind of quickly go over them. Sound pedagogy, you have a pedagogical sheet in your folders that Echoes and Reflections always bases everything we do on. Um, we'll get back to that in just a minute. Enhancing your personal knowledge about the Holocaust, but specifically the plight of the refugees, Jewish refugees. Um, looking at multimedia assets, in a few minutes we're going to be looking at some testimonies um, from survivors. And then identifying opportunities to connect the lessons of the Holocaust with today. We've already done some of that. And then hopefully again, building your confidence and capacity to teach this subject. Um, this is the pedagogical principles spelled out a little differently than on your sheet. Um, but again, we do this with everything we do in ECHOES, defining terms, examining anti-Semitism, providing a historical context, using primary sources, teaching the human story, making the Holocaust relevant, which is often difficult for some of our students. Um, but again, when we make these connections, that can help bridge that gap. Encouraging critical thinking, ensuring a supportive learning environment, and fostering empathy. So those are all goals with um, not only this lesson, but also any that we do. So this is a shortened version. If you want to look in your folders, you have a whole sheet with broader definitions. This is really simplified. Uh, again, going back to what you were saying with the difference between a refugee and asylum seeker and a migrant or immigrant. And so this is something that I've shared that sheet with my students. I think it's really important going back to defining terms as the number one um, principle and making sure, like you said, that our students and that we know the differences 
among these groups because I think a lot of people don't, right? And they use them interchangeably. Um, and so again, just getting to the quick version of it that you have the longer definitions, a refugee is fleeing armed conflict or persecution, right? Again, that, that's their push, right? That it's dangerous, they may not live um, if they don't get out of the place where they are. An asylum seeker is a person seeking international protection. Their claim for refugee status has not yet been determined. So they're kind of in limbo, right? Their, their um, status is up in the air, right, at this point. And then a migrant is where it doesn't include war or persecution. There still could be, like you were saying, that push, right, financially, educationally, opportunities that do or do not exist in their home country. Nutrition, exactly. And it can be a different type of conflict. Sure. And it can be armed. Yes. If you think about um, the black Puerto Rican immigrants who um, the neighborhoods where they, they're not playing. Right. Even though it's not war. Right. But there is conflict. Thank you. Good point. Yeah. Can I ask you if you know when the term refugee really came about in terms of of this sort of political process of people moving. And the reason I ask is I don't know too much in the weeds, but I was thinking of Russian Jewish people who suffered under the pogroms. They were right. certainly persecuted, but they were labeled immigrants, right? right? As yeah. they moved from the, you know, yeah, to you're the right. US or the places. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of a yeah. some of this. I would guess it was because during the Holocaust, there's no policy for refugees, right? <coughs> I'm thinking maybe post. I don't yeah. know, though. Does anybody know when we started? That's a great question. Because we're, yeah. as historians, we're also focused on, you know, the differences sometimes. Right. Very, very yeah, I think so, too. That would be my best guess. And to yeah. this, just in terms of politics in the mix, um, generally, refugees talk about that generation that they have. Displaced. Right. But as far as the UN goes, with the Palestinian refugees, they're the only refugees that have their children and grandchildren retain that refugee status. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where it's generational. Right. Yes. So everybody else right. doesn't have access to that term intergenerational. Right. That's a good point. Yeah. And, and see, again, like my students would never go with oh, either of those, but, but I love, that's why I love working with the adult audience, because it's like all these things, wow, yeah, there's so much, but right? There's so much here, yeah. And then with that, with that discussion, we create a space for a new term, refugee adjacent, or something like you have residual refugee impacts mm -hmm. for Absolutely. Yeah. That, that would be my guess as to where refugees are. You can't be, you know, you have these groups of people in politics who say you can't call them immigrants. Right. They're not really immigrants, so what do we call them? Well, yeah. They're seeking refuge. So right. Refugee. Yeah. Yeah. So thinking about where these came from and when, I think is important as well. Yeah. And so keeping those, sorry, I don't want to go there yet. Um, so keeping these in mind, I want to just give you a couple of other things that if you want to jot down these numbers on your um, sheet with the definitions, you certainly may. Um, if you go to, this is one of the places where I will go back, um, the UNHCR, um, this has, this is where we get a lot of our numbers from. Um, they had, I went to a different section the other day when I was updating some of the numbers, and they had a fact that popped up that I found fascinating. And again, this would be relevant to my students. Every minute in 2018, 25 people were forced to flee their country. So every minute, right? So when we think about those huge numbers, that's how we get there, right? Is 25 people per minute forced to flee their countries. Um, as of 2016, 51% uh, of the refugee population were children. So that's another factor to keep in mind. Um, when they looked at the numbers, and again, this was 2016, uh, the largest growing group of refugees were South Sudanese. Um, 
the, there were a lot of Syrians, of course, um, Afghans, but South Sudanese was the largest growing. Like I said, in the Phoenix area, at least, we're getting a lot from the DRC. We're getting a lot from Burma as well. And so we're seeing these kind of trends right, in all of this. So this is a great resource. I'm just throwing it out there as well of um, something that you can use. So we're going to go back and look at a couple of testimonies. And I want you to think and keep in mind, what do these, <coughs> excuse me, we're watching two, what do these testimonies tell us about Jewish Germans living in Germany before 1933? Okay, so before 1933. And we'll come back and look at the after part of that in just a minute. Okay, so, so to get to the testimonies, you go to the Echoes and Reflections website, if you're not familiar with this, and you go to the Teach. Teach is where most of what you want is going to be. The pedagogy is there that you have printed out, but you want to go to Lesson Plans, and these are the units that we have. Okay, and I'll show you later how those are set up. And so we are going to go to Henry Laurent, who is in the anti-Semitism unit. Again, I'll just show you quickly since we're here. Um, every unit opens with a quote. You have over here a video toolbox. I love these. Um, they're meant for teachers. They're, they're put out by Yad Vashem. They're quick videos. They're like usually between 10 and 15 minutes. They're not meant to be shown in class, but just to give you more background information on that topic, so it's about anti-Semitism. Um, it brings up your standards if you need to show those to a principal or um, department chair. They're all for every lesson spelled out for you. Um, and then you have all your resources over here okay, that you can see. So we are going to start with Henry Laurent, and so you just click on it. And it always gives a little biography. Um, he was born in 1924 in Konigsberg, Germany, sent on the kinder transport to the UK where he stayed for the duration of the war. His interview was conducted in the US and he was 15 years old when the war began. And they're all written that way exactly. And you know, here with the how old was he, that's to add to that relevancy for our students. My students always notice his shirt he has Noah's Ark, and so seeing the kinder transport is kind of a Noah's Ark, I think is intentional on his part with this interview. And so let's listen again, thinking about life before 
So I just, I was, as I was listening or watching that, not listening, um, this one was after 33, sorry. We'll get to the one before 33 in just a minute. I grabbed the wrong paper. Um, but what, what stands out about his experience as you were reading that? He was shocked. Or yes. Was shocked. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. I'm thinking about like assimilation. So he talks about even the most well assimilated among us will eventually be hit with that fact that we are another. Yeah. And I think kind of thinking about like, good immigrants and bad immigrants, mm. the distinctions we're making in the end doesn't say you need to be a good immigrant. Right. What else? Any other thoughts? I mean, he wasn't an immigrant. No. Yeah. He was in Germany. He becomes an immigrant. Yes. I mean, what struck me was how accommodating um, the family obviously was to, even though they're assimilated Jews, it's assimilated by to the point where they're actually partaking in Christian German activity. Right. Yeah. They're fitting in with their neighbors and such. Yes, their community. Yeah. Yeah, they were just living their, their lives and um, feeling like, you know, we are all the same. We're all together doing this. And, right. and then all of a sudden they were hit with, no, you are not like us. And we don't want you here. Yeah. As you pointed out in class, if they were Jewish, they were not German. Mm -hmm. yeah. After woman named Margaret Lambert and what I love about these um, clips is that they're very short right our kids attention spans are not that long so they are good with this usually also if they don't get it, sometimes I don't put the subtitles up um, we cannot get the sound to work yeah that's what I've been told. thank you so I'll show you this is what I want to show and it just like there's no sound even up here so anyway, while he's figuring that out, um, sometimes I'll turn off the, the subtitles because I want my students to practice hearing different accents because they're really bad listeners, right? Um, and they just, they, if they can't understand somebody, often they just shut down and say, well, I, I'm not gonna listen, I, I can't understand that. And so I really make them listen because when I do have a survivor come into the classroom, I want them to give them that attention. So this is really good practice for that. So if you are going to invite survivors in, it's a great way to, you know, just get their ears used to listening differently. That's all it is, right? So Margaret Lambert, we are going to hear from next. And um, her testimony is also very short. Hers is before 1933. So again, keeping that in mind of what life was like. Um, although Mr. Laurent, I think, you know, again, in that first part of it, they fit in. Right? They did what everybody else did. Um, and I, one of the things we didn't touch on with his was that idea, too, of the name. Right? That is, it was his father's name, that nameplate, and how important our names are to us. Right? What they mean to us, how we got them. There's something important about that. And when it's besmirched like that, it's, it's devastating. Right? Any other thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I think, too, being a doctor, the time yeah. has taken him to become a doctor, a respected member of the community. When you have that position, you're not expecting that something like that, that disrespect, um, that, you know, assault on your, your character, your yeah. name. And I think the whole publicity of it is on his, not only his office, but his home. Mm -hmm. So now he's, he realizes he's yeah, yeah, and that doctor being that, um, you know, such an important member of the community and, and being there for everybody and now how that changes, yeah, and, that, and how the embarrassment's on him, right, that humiliation on him. He did nothing. Okay, thank you. Do you guys mind, okay, do you guys mind reading one more until this sound's on? Okay. You're all teachers, you're readers, you like the kids. Okay, so we just kind of Oops, no, I'm just going to We want to go to Margaret Lambert. 
Um, she was born in 1914 in Lachheim, Germany. She did not experience life in the ghettos or concentration camps. In 1937, she fled from Germany to the home of a family friend living in the US. Her interview was conducted in the US and she was 25 years old when the war began. So first of all, her testimony to me is so relevant to my students. What's relevant about it to our kids? The rebellion, right? My mom gave me stuff where I didn't like it, right? What else? What else does she rebel against? Yeah, the gender norms, right? She wants. She loves sports. Wanted to be a PE coach or teacher. Yeah. And. Um, so our, our students definitely respond to that. Do you want to try playing it again? Okay. Yeah. And we're going to see another testimony by her as well. Um, what, so what was life like for her before 1933? Normal. What about being Jewish? Didn't matter, right? No. I think more than it didn't matter, it wasn't really. I think um, you would say that they were culturally Jewish, yeah. but not practicing Jewish. So yeah, that end statement, right? I think that's where it came as such a big shock because most Jews in Germany at that time were culturally Jewish. So thinking about being Jewish was never on their radar. Yes. So rethinking all of that. Exactly. Yeah. Mm, right. Right. She was. Um, I believe it was a little more urban. Yeah. Okay. Right. It's not Berlin, but yeah. Yeah. And it's very fairly rural outside of the city. And 
we'll be talking about that because I think that's a really important piece that we need to teach our students is that history of anti-Semitism, right? And I'll show you a couple of resources that you could use to teach that because our kids come in thinking that Hitler started that, right? So it, yes, very important to look at that background. Yeah? I mean, you can kind of relate it to today. A lot of American Jews for the last 20, 30 years haven't really thought that being Jewish marks them in any way. They participate in society and so forth. Mm -hmm. But with the latest attacks on synagogues mm -hmm. and the rise of personal attacks, it started to rattle the Jewish community, you know, you think twice about entering the temple. Right. All of these things that I would imagine that German Jews at the time, the Weimar period is what we've experienced up until fairly recently. Mm -hmm. And it's that slow evolution that now we're having to think we again need to worry about it. Right. Yeah. And so these kind of waves that we see of it. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, let's take a 10 minute break. I was going to give you a break anyway, not right this second, but we will now. Um, and I'll see if we can get this figured out. So 10 minute break. All right. So keeping that lens that we were looking at before of life in Germany before 1933, we're going to watch another very short clip. Um, this is Mr. H. Henry Sinison. And he was born in Berlin, Germany in 1925 did not experience life in the ghettos or concentration camps. Uh, 1939, he, along with his brother, fled to France to live with their uncle. After the Nazis entered France, both Henry and his brother were sent to live in an orphanage and later fled to the US. His uh, interview was conducted in the US, and he was 14 when the war began. We lived in the center of Berlin. My parents were upper middle class. My father was a sales representative for a large textile mill. He earned a very nice living. We had a nice apartment. Uh, the ambience was cultured. We had music. Uh, I remember my parents dressing up in evening clothes and going to the opera. We had uh, theater and they would take us along. Uh, we uh, were comfortable economically, at least before the uh, National Socialist regime took over in Germany. And I'm talking about the early years that I remember, in the early 1930s before 1933. My father, in particular, was German first and Jewish second. Now, this does not mean that he was not an observant Jew. We, we were what was then called observant. In this country, in the USA, this can be translated into conservative. We observed all the holidays. We went to uh, services Friday night and uh, Saturday morning. If my father didn't have to work, he made sure that I went and my brother went. Uh, we both, my brother and I, uh, sang in the synagogue choir. Usually, the synagogues had boys' choirs. Uh, we celebrated all the holidays. Uh, my father never worked on the holidays. We were, without keeping the kosher home, yet we observed all the traditions. So first of all, I just want to point out that um, I have to unpack a lot of that for my students because they, um, I don't get many Jewish students. And so at the top of every unit, there is a glossary with keywords from that particular unit. So you can use that to help you. I just you know, explain it to them, like what kosher means and, and you know, what he's talking about with conservative, not politics, right, but religion. And so just getting into some of those ideas. But what did you get from that, again, about life before 1933 for him? Normal, nice, quite nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was interesting to me that at that time he felt like it was possible to parse apart his identities and yeah. keep them separate from each other. And after that time, it was all one and you couldn't separate your no. from your identity. No. Identity. Yeah. Um, we were German first, right? Yeah. I think what it is basically saying is that the 
there was a public sphere and a private sphere. Mm. So being Jewish was definitely your private sphere. Right. And in your public sphere, you were German. Yeah. And so proud to be so. Yeah. And then yeah. he uses the word national socialist, which I think is interesting too. Yeah. So by saying that too, he's saying then once the laws were enacted, there was no longer a difference between public and private sphere. Right. Right. Yeah. But you were saying that they, they just are one now. Yeah, exactly. Socialized, That's your identity. That was the climate, right? Yeah. It was either your national identity then your first. Because yeah. you can't build a nation with people who are separated at these base mm -hmm. levels, right? And I think also that this idea for, um, because what you're saying is exactly right with that sense of nationalism, but I think also that, that there was pride in one's country. Right, and so for example, I'm thinking of the survivor and writer um, Primo Levi, who you know says in his book Survival in Auschwitz, or if this is a man, um, you know that if somebody asked me, I was I was Italian, right? And then if they pressed me and said, well, but what else? And oh, okay, well I'm Jewish, you know. So there was that sense of um, I'm a German or I'm an Italian or I'm whatever. Yeah, back here and then up here. But it goes back to the emancipation of European Jews. And it goes back to the Haskalah. That's what preempted Jews now to see themselves as Italian first or German yeah. first. And the First World War kind of indicates how much that was because you saw Jews um, sign up for mm -hmm. action on a higher percentage Disproportionately, than, yes. than um, you know, uh, Aryan or Yeah, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a number actually with that. <coughs> So approximately 100,000 Jewish Germans fought for Germany in World War I. Um, remember, the total number of Jewish um, Germans was 550,000. So that means 20% of the Jewish people fought in the Great War. So yeah, they were the most overrepresented in Germany. And then you look at the numbers, so on average, 50% of them were Right, right. Then you're looking at 18 to 30. Exactly. Years. So pretty much every single able Right. Young German Jewish male. Yes. Was in it, yeah. And then that, of course, is going to create issues later when that's not recognized, right? Well, By, kind of recognized at first. At first, yeah, sorry, jumping ahead, yes. Recognized, but then later, you know, the, it's removed, their names are removed from uh, memorials, they don't get their pensions any longer, things like that. Yes, you had your hand up. Well, when I see the lesson, violence that comes out of it. Uh -huh. to another, one more testimony from Margaret Lambert, and this one is in the unit um, called Nazi Germany here. And again, set up the exact same way, so I won't go over that. Not all of the uh, survivor testimonies show up. You can see there are maps, all kinds of great things. Not all of them show up in two units, but some do. And so now she's going to be looking at life. Remember, she said that, you know, it was all good until a certain time. And we know what she means by that, of course. So now she's going to address, again, very briefly, um, what happened after that certain time. It started in 1933, really. But I had very good friends of whom I knew that they were 
members of the Nazi party since 1928, and she was one of my best friends. She didn't care that I was Jewish, and I didn't care that she was a Nazi. She was one of my sports friends, and we got along very well. But then, of course, in 1933, everything changed. Like, overnight, you could not go into a public place. No restaurants, no swimming pools, no movies, nothing. You, couldn't, you, you were not allowed in any public place anymore. And uh, people that you knew wouldn't talk to you anymore. Friends that you had, they would shun you, most of them. Uh, not because they hated us all of a sudden, but they were all afraid because that was, that was the way it was. You talk to a Jew and you'll be punished. It was very hard. I was 19 years old and all of a sudden I was shut off from everything. I got a letter from my sports club and all of that. I wasn't welcome there anymore because I was Jewish. And that was, that, that was the thing that I loved to do most, as I said before, sports. And all of a sudden that was finished. There was nothing I could do. We just were really vegetating, if you want to call it that. So. So what changes there? Mm. For her personally, what changes? Yeah, like a non-person, right? Everything changes. Yeah. Well, by 1933, anti-Semitism had become the law, had become policy, mm. and uh, people to you know associate with Jews. Mm -hmm. And again, Not that's that's what my students relate to, mm -hmm. right? Is that all of a sudden your friends aren't your friends anymore, you know, just overnight because of that climate, right? So they they get that. They get that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And especially in '35 with the Nuremberg laws, right? Absolutely, yeah. Just, just a, a few things. Um, the laws were, it wasn't done all at once. No. It was done systematically. In mm -hmm. And so, really, the climate, the, the shunning might have been what was felt most in 1933, the prevalence of anti Semitic literature, sure. science. Propaganda. Mm -hmm. But the laws really start 1935. Right. Um, and then progressively. Mm -hmm. So it's like a drip, drip, drip. Mm -hmm. Also, too, that I think you should be kind of drawn out of this was the fact that she said she had a, a good friend of hers from the sports club was a Nazi since 1928. Yes. They still had a relationship up until 1933. Yes. And that speaks volumes as to how Germans even perceived the Nazi party. Right. That they could pick and choose out of the Nazi doctrine what they liked. Mm -hmm. Um, they might have liked other things. Maybe this friend was like, she wasn't concerned about the Jewish, the anti-Semitic stuff mm -hmm. coming out of the Nazi party. Maybe she liked the other platforms that the Nazi party exactly. um, professed. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't an issue. But then 1933, when they come to power, then Nazi um, members, um, whether it's the youth groups or whatever, they're told that if they are associating with Jews, right. then they're going to be kicked right. out of this, that, and the other. So. I mean, that goes to what she says at the end, where there's this climate of fear also for Germans. Right. And 1933, we see, like you said, dribs and drops. We see the boycott that really wasn't that effective. We see, um, you know, the book burnings and things like that that are making these statements. But you're right, until 35, when the Nuremberg laws come in, then now we have laws, and those continue, right, to be added on. Exactly. And so I think, yeah, I think you're right with that statement about the friend. You know, that they could still be friends for those five years. But then when those things, the propaganda, especially, I think the, the Der Sturmer and such, that it's right there all the time and you're faced with that. And, and so, yeah. And going back to, I appreciate you bringing that up, the systematic nature, because our students often think that, you know, when we start studying Holocaust, that 1933, Hitler becomes chancellor and, and now, you know, Auschwitz is built, right? And they, they, that's really what's in their minds, that everything happens at once. So it's very important to, whether it's using a timeline or, or something along those lines, to show them 
right? Physically where things are happening and when and how one thing allows another to happen. I yeah. think you can bring me to the student. 1933 is the first concentration camp. Right, Dachau, yes. And it's not Jews that are no. victims of these things. No, no. It's Germans. So that's where the fear of Germans becomes sure. of who they're associating with, what they're saying. So Germans end up policing themselves. Right, right. Yeah, it's those who go against the Nazis who are put in those first camps. Exactly. And so I just want to point out, because um, we were talking about the anti-Semitism unit, I just wanted to point out a couple of things that were in that unit uh, that you might want to use when you're talking about this, again, to go back to um, being really clear with our terms and such. There's a map that looks at Jewish communities in Europe before the Nazi rise to power. Um, that you, if you download it, it gets bigger. Um, and so that's a really good resource um, for you to use. I mentioned the video toolbox, which can give you a really good background as well. Um, down here, and again, it tells you all the time how much, so each lesson is about 60 to 90 minutes, so they're very classroom friendly. You have more testimonies, some really excellent ones. Here's a student handout. Um, not letting me do view more for some reason, but if I go to that, there is, here we can look at this one. Um, here's a summary of anti-Semitism that's an excellent resource. And they try to keep them pretty short, so this is you know two pages, right? And gives them a good, solid background of that history of anti-Semitism, so that's a good one. I also wanted to point out this. This is from USHMM, and you can get it on their website. Um, if you just Google that title, it will pop up. It's a 13-minute video. It's the one they show in the museum that gives that history of anti-Semitism. I use this one in my classroom. Um, and again, it just really gives them um, some good background knowledge of that. So you might want to use that one. Um, I see some of you copying it down, taking pictures. OK. And then um, going back to the ECHO site, um, they also have, the last thing I'll show you on the anti-Semitism unit is there are some um, examples of propaganda that was directed toward children. My students really enjoy looking at these um, and I think they get a lot out of it. Um, it's interesting because like if you look at this one, I'll just show you one as an example. And I have my students analyze it and think about what's going on. We talk about the, the, the source that it came from, a book called The Poisonous Mushroom that was very popular in Germany for children at the time. And um, what, what idea is getting across here? What would our kids relate to in that picture? Taking candy from strangers, they get that. My kids always go, stranger danger, right? That's, that's the message they get from that, and that's exactly right. Um, and if you read the whole story, the little boy, you know, you can see he's kind of thinking about it, right? Like, oh, it's candy, right? Like, oh. But in the story, he reads, or sorry, he, um, he, he remembers that his parents told him to beware of strangers with candy, and he grabs his sister, sister's hand and they run off. Um, Calvin College collected all of these and translated them, and so you can read all the stories on their website. It's just calvincollege.edu, and if you search the poisonous mushroom, you'll see that. But what's interesting is I just saw a few days ago um, a flyer that was going around in some Phoenix neighborhoods using that same idea. Um, and it was saying, watch your children, you know, the Jews are out to get them and that they are molesting children. And so it's this trope that goes way back. And again, it, we, we see these things come back. Um, and so it's important, again, to talk to students about that history and where that comes from and why it recycles itself, right? Not just that one, but any of those tropes. So you saw that just Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just a few days ago I saw a notice about it that I think our ADL put it out, that, hey, these are out there, watch, you know, yeah. Hey, yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And my kids are always shocked by that. Um, the fact that he gave money to the Nazi Party and all of that. Yeah. They're. 
It's an eye opener for them. So we're going to go into this um, next unit again, which is Nazi Germany. And we're going to do a quick activity, get you standing up for just a minute. Um, first of all, this is a great article, The Weimar Republic and the Rise of the Nazi Party. Um, I love the background information, and I've used that one with my students. Another, again, more maps, more testimonies. But this is the one we're going to just do right now. And again, you could do this as a mentee, or you could do it. Um, I just have my students raise their hands. But these are rights, and it's asking which rights are most important to you. So we have date or marry whomever you choose, go to a public school close to home, live in a neighborhood of your choice, swim and play in a public swimming pool or park, eat what you want according to taste, culture, and religious custom, be able to own a pet, leave your house whenever you choose, shop at stores and businesses of your choosing, or vote. Okay, so it's hard, right? I know, they're all important to us. Okay, so just think for a minute for yourself. Stand up if you would say that voting would be the most important for you out of those. All right, so we have a couple voting. Anybody want to join or are you good? Okay, so three, four for voting. Okay. All right, how about date or marry whomever you choose? Stand up if that's your most important. Two, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so that's our contender so far. What about live in a neighborhood of your choice? Got a couple. Ron, are you just indecisive? <laughs> so we've got like four. Um, how about the public school? close to your home. Okay. What about shopping at stores and businesses of your choosing? Pet? I know. I love my dogs. Do, do you like to do this with your students? Yeah, but they get to number importance. So they're not, I'm just having you guys choose one right no. now, right? But yeah, they choose order of importance. So again, think from a student perspective. What's going to be important to our kiddos? <laughs> Food often does come up. Sometimes pet comes up. Date and marry is their number one choice. I will get a few because I have seniors. And so a few who turn 18 when I do this one, they're like, vote. Because they're so excited they get to vote. I love that. I love that they're excited about that. Um, but yeah, most of them, it's date or marry whomever they want, right? Because that's what they're thinking about. Um, so that one's high on their list of priorities. You can do this lots of different ways, have them discuss in groups or you know, in pairs. Um, sometimes I've had them try to get it down to one um, and that never works, but you know. Uh, but it's important for them to think about, again, what's important to them, what matters, because this leads then to what happens in Nazi Germany, right? This is what leads into, like what Margaret Lambert was talking about, what leads into those Nuremberg laws when yes, even going to the swimming pool is not allowed if you're Jewish, right? If any, do any of you use Gerda Wiseman Klein's book, All But My Life? Um, I highly recommend it. I use it in my class, and um, the students love it. And she talks about standing outside, she's in Poland, and standing outside of a swimming pool, public pool, and she's outside the fence, and it's a hot day, and she can't go in. Right? She's not allowed to go in. So again, just making some connections for them. So I love this activity, um, excellent one to use. All right, so we talked about a little bit with um, Mr. Lawrence about life after. We also saw Margaret Lambert's. Let's look at one more about life after 1933. I think we fell and we children fell in more acutely because of the harassment that we received almost on a daily basis in school and on the street and uh, on, a, on a different level than the parents. The parents thought initially that this would blow over, you see, until more and more laws, when the Nuremberg laws and other laws were introduced, which made it more difficult. We couldn't have the same maid in the household anymore. We couldn't buy in certain stores anymore. We couldn't go to a swimming pool anymore. We couldn't go into parks anymore. And all of these laws were introduced 
uh, we really felt it more and more year after year. Okay, so again, very short. Anything stand out to you in that one? Say it again. Couldn't have the same name. Yeah, yeah. What else? The, the fact that the adults felt that it was the world over. Yeah. Which a lot of people did believe, right? Nobody thought it would last as long as it did. Yeah. I always think it's interesting how he separates again, because we talked about this earlier, children and adults, and that perspective, right? And how, how they feel it differently. Well, I'm saying adults would just shun them but not say anything, whereas children who are meaner. Mm -hmm. And you see mm -hmm. them all in middle school. Right? And Oftentimes. Yeah, so which makes it different. Right, well, sure, it's sure. Because in school, you had the um, racial lessons being taught. Yes. So quite often, if there was a Jewish student, they were called up in front of the class, in front of their classmates, as an example of a non-area. So mm -hmm. they're being subjected to, um, and also the reports that these students, that were straight-A students, are now being fed. Right. Um, like class activities, class, um, uh, if you go on a trip somewhere, Jewish children were not permitted to go on those trips anymore. Mm -hmm. So within the school, they're being even more actively isolated. If you had Nazi teachers, they were encouraged to wear their uniform to, to teach the class. That right. was increasingly intimidating for these students. Exactly. Yeah, back here I saw Also, once that line of disenfranchisement was, was crossed, it becomes much easier to cross it again. But like once you cross that first initial line, it, 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 the, the moral aspect of it kind of goes away and you can justify almost anything. Right, yeah. Once, that, li once that line is crossed, yeah. Yeah. So I, I was thinking, going back to the, the parents, the adults kind of not taking it maybe as seriously because maybe they didn't get the, the attacks as much. Mm -hmm. It also occurs to me that it's possible that they, depending on their ages, lived through anti-Semitic waves like the Dreyfus Affair mm -hmm. and other things that did rise up and then subside, and perhaps that was like a bit of the hope. Mm -hmm. I mean, it did subside relatively, right. you know, but like that idea of we'll get through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's because of that sort of the, the history of the tribal And I think that going along with what you're all saying is, you know, again, if you're going back to the other testimonies we've seen, when you, when you see yourself as, as German, right, again, and so you want to think, well, okay, this is my country and, and they won't do this, right? And people thought the Germans were so cultured and, and above this, right, that that wouldn't happen. And yeah. building on what you're saying, mm -hmm. I think the reason the comment about the maid stood out to me mm -hmm. so much is these people were not the downtrodden who are so typically um, put upon and, and victimized. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, and so we're going to be looking at this because that's what, you know, again, the, that's where our brains go. We have that optimism, right, and think that things are going to be okay. Um, and that's part of it. Before we get to the next slide, which all of this is going to fit in with, I just wanted to point out, because when you were talking about the schools, I'm not going to play the testimony, but I want to point it out to you. It's back in the anti-Semitism unit. My kids love this one. It's a woman named Judith Becker. And she talks about she's and her brother are Jewish, and they're allowed to stay in their school. And what you were talking about with these Nazi teachers, right? One comes in one day, and he's talking about, oh, you know, perfect Aryans, and da-da-da, and, and showing the features. And he, he grabs her brother and says, come on up. Look how wonderful his skull is shaped. And all the kids know he's Jewish. That's the interesting part is they all know and they're snickering. And the guy's getting mad because he thinks they're making fun of him or something. But it's because they all know he's Jewish. And he's like, oh, take off your shirt. Look at this build on this kid, you know, pure Aryan. And, and they're just dying, right? 
And eventually, after that, the kid, uh, her brother, uh, unfortunately, has to um, leave school. So that's um, the unfortunate part of that. OK, so going back to our PowerPoint, I want to go to this slide. Let me get back into our slideshow. OK, so looking at some emigration rates then. So all of this stuff that we're seeing building up, again, systematically, right? all of this is happening. If we look at 1933 when Hitler comes into power, and like you said, I believe there were like 50 camps by the end of the year, like small ones, right? Small ones by the end of 1933 in Nazi Germany. And again, not for Jews, but for anybody who opposes the Nazis. 1933, between 37 to 38,000 leave Germany. That would include the Frank family, right? That's when they leave too. Okay, so 37 to 38,000 leave. Jewish, yes. And then we go to 1938, 36,000. Now we're including Austria because of the Anschluss. 36,000 leave. And then we go to 1939. So this is after Kristallnacht, after the Anschluss, and now we have 77,000 who leave. So. Anything that's complicated about these numbers? Anything that complicates our thinking or our students' thinking? Where did they go? Where did they go? Okay. And we have maps that we can show, right? I don't have them on this, but we. Male, can find them. female, and what age? Ages, male, female. I mean, my students are going to ask me right away, well, why did everybody leave? Uh -huh. That's the first question they're going to say. You know, they don't understand the context of the war. You know, but right. That's a very common question. Why didn't they just leave? Yeah, right. Yeah. Right? At this point. Why didn't everybody go? Any other complications? Yeah. Why did it double in one year? Yeah. So it doubles in that year. And so again, looking at Kristallnacht, we'd want to go over that with them and such. And in uh, unit three, or sorry, unit one has um, the first one called Nazi Germany. Um, sorry, called Studying the Holocaust. That one has a really good lesson on Kristallnacht. Yeah, anything else? Why fewer people went in 1938 than 1933? Say that one time. You'd think more people would have left in 1938 if things were getting worse. Right. Than 33, uh -huh. it wasn't as bad based on the, the torch that we saw. And again, so I think a lot goes back to that reaction. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But I, I think it goes back to, uh, did everybody have the financial means right. in 1938, 1939? I would think, based on what you showed us at the beginning, uh -huh. it had to do with money. Yeah. And, and the, the more affluent people could, could leave. Okay. And so going back to Otto Frank's letter, which again was 41, but yeah, yeah. Here yeah, and then here. It may not be where did they, it may not be where did they go, but where could they go? Uh -huh. Sometimes you wouldn't let them in. Mm -hmm. I think those numbers should be split um, because, I mean, granted, Austria becomes part of the greater right? Right. But there's a different in how things are carried out in Germany yeah. versus how things are carried out in Austria. Yes. So I would say the greater proportion of immigrants leaving or refugees leaving would be Austria. Austria. Because it was so much more brutal. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and that's a suggestion I will give them because I, I agree. So I don't know if this is, I don't teach high school, so I'm not sure this is a question that would rise from it, but do the numbers, so would they, would they raise questions, would high school students raise questions regarding then the number of ultimate fatalities? Like if so many people left, does it raise questions about then the, um, the Holocaust in other countries? Mm. And how that leaks over, or I mean, like that's what I'm saying. I don't know if that my students haven't gone there yeah. with that. I don't think they're that sophisticated, but right. uh, sorry. That's why I said I don't know if they would I'm being honest. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
young men would be the victim. Right. So and and molested is women, young, young children, and the elderly. Yeah, and when we look at Crystal Knocked, women and the elderly were left alone, right, and children. Yeah, so, and, and with this also 1938, because of Crystal Knocked, remember, that's why we get the kinder transport, right, because again, it elevates things, and so we're getting those um, 10,000, or roughly 10,000. So we're gonna come back to this in just a little bit, but I want you to think about just now, and I'm just gonna have you do it with somebody near you or a group of you. I have two questions here, you can choose one. Okay, so one is looking at how does our understanding of anti-Jewish fears and prejudices, including those about national security and job competition in the 1930s and 40s, help us understand how those factors influence attitudes about immigration and refugee communities today? Or how can our understanding of how Jewish Germans, or German Jews, however you want to refer to it, felt toward Germany prior to and following 1933 help us understand how refugees feel about their home country and therefore their decision to stay or flee. So I'll give you a few minutes, talk with some people around you about one of those, okay? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, in my classroom, if I were doing this, we would have a discussion about what the discussions were. In the interest of time, we're going to move on, so hold those thoughts. And I want to move to connecting to today. We're going to go back to the Holocaust as well. We're going to kind of go back and forth again. Um, but looking at today, um, the Northern Triangle, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, um, this has been an area where we've heard a lot of um, hostile rhetoric um, about Central American refugees and asylum seekers. There's been questions about uh, those terms even with people and you know whether or not they really fit that, um, th those definitions. So again, I think it's important to clarify those definitions. Um, one thing I would warn you is if you're doing this in the classroom, be careful if you have students from these areas, of course, be sensitive, as I know you would. Um, we get a lot of kids from Guatemala at my school, and so I you know, want to be very careful when we're, we're talking about this issue. Um, refugees from this area, as uh, they increased um, from 2012 to 2015 five times. So again, it, and it's since then grown exponentially as well. Um, if we look at today, again, going back to that UNHCR site, 50% um, of our refugees are from the Northern Triangle and asylum seekers. 60% of that is families and unaccompanied minors. And so, you know, again, it, it could be a lot of our, do you guys get many from this area here? Yeah, so you get it, you understand. So the Obama administration announced the exp expansion of its refugee program to admit more Central American refugees in July of 2016. And there were several members of Congress who denounced this idea. And this is just a quote from one of them, uh, Representative Goodlot from Virginia said, the Obama administration has decided to blow wide open any small discretion it has in order to reward individuals who have no lawful presence in the United States with the ability to bring their family members here. So first of all, again, we know that seeking asylum is a right, correct? And so this um, no lawful presence, right, is questionable. But what's his, what's his real concern here? The families, right? Yeah, that it's not just one or two people, but a whole family, right, that's going to come along. And that's what he's, so again, he's not thinking about that push and what's pushing them here, he's thinking that it's like this reward that they get, that they, oh, I can just bring my whole family, um, is, is the assumption with that. Again, if you ask the refugees, think back to those quotes that we saw earlier, again, often they don't, they don't wanna be here, right? But it's that push is so strong of what's happened in their countries. So some of the things, and again, this isn't on a slide, but we know this, um, that in some of these areas in the Northern Triangle, women and young girls, are becoming brides of gang members. Um, the gang rapes and such that are happening because of that. Men and young boys become mules and work for the gangs, right? So it's very much centered on those gangs and what's happening, requiring people to pay the gangs or face violence or even death. Um, local authorities who are unwilling or unable to enforce safety for um, their residents. And so just to give you, a, again, from that perspective, one refugee from El Salvador shared that he and his wife and ch uh, five children were doing really well in El Salvador. Um, they were working, they had good jobs, their son was ready to go to college, and then the gangs began to intimidate them. Um, the extremes of their efforts left this family no choice but to flee to other parts of El Salvador. They did that twice, and the gangs followed them every time, like tracked them. And so they fled to Mexico eventually. So again, that push is, is serious, right? And like you said earlier, that's not a war, right? It's not what we might define as a conflict, but here it is, it's a conflict, very serious. Um, an El Salvadorian refugee, a woman of a two-year-old whose husband was murdered by gang members who overtook her town, fled to Mexico. She said simply, it was never in my thinking to leave my country. Right, so again, those, those connections that we're seeing. Um, a refugee from Honduras who fled under the threat of death put it this way, and this one I did quote, 
You don't migrate now in search of the American dream. You go for your life. And I think that's a great discussion to have with students because they do typically study the American dream and they understand that concept. This is a different story, right? Completely different. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I'm getting political. I'm not a teacher. But um, you know, I can't remember the name of the ship that the Jews had tried to come to. The St. Louis. Yeah, 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 we'll Louis talk about that. To make it. But, but when we had the Cold War with the Russians, the Cubans were welcome. Mm -hmm. And no one raised the issue about Cubans coming into America. There's a, there's a political will of the United States. For a while, yeah. Um, <laughs> right, so I guess Short I'm, while. Short while, yes. Yeah, but, um, yeah. but I think that makes it, you know, you know plus America historically always had a problem with people with dark skin. Um, right. And, and Again, I the other. Well, one of the exceptions of that partially you know, if Russia had taken over those countries and, and they were developing nuclear weapons or whatever they are, maybe we would welcome the refugees. Back. <laughs> Might be a different story, right? right? The United States would always take somebody from a communist country. That's why Vietnam, you know, it opened it up. Yeah, yeah. Because of the Cold War, after World War II, right. you'd always take them. Right. Because of communism. Mm -hmm. For people of a certain age, and maybe not you all, but older than 70, say, when their grandparents came over, they assimilated, and they assimilated quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, the ones that came over before 1900. I think before some did. Yeah, I think some quickly. did. The goal was to assimilate. The goal. The goal. Was to I think that's a better way to put it. The yeah. goal was to assimilate. Yeah. You know, the Italians wouldn't speak Italian anymore. That's it. In, in, 19, in 1915. That Well, I think there's two more pride in diversity and such, right? There that there's was, there wasn't before and there wasn't. No, there wasn't that sense of. Later, that's it. Yeah, okay, yeah. So I think there was more of a push for that. Also, this group of people who were afraid to assimilate, who want help. Exactly. I was going to say because you still have many people who never learned English, and yeah, absolutely. So it's it's kind of mixed, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, to maybe change that and say that that was that it was a necessity. Mm -hmm. That was that was the that was normal. You came here, you you. So it's a melting if pot. You didn't, if you did not yeah. assimilate, then you were ostracized, then you were seen as an other. And mm -hmm. you, you know, they didn't. They yeah. wanted to be ostracized. They wanted to. Oh yeah, I I agree. I agree, I agree with mm -hmm. both. I'm, I'm just saying the goal maybe just more like that. Survival, so that necessitated the assimilation, but there was also pockets that said, "Hey, we right. want to maintain our culture." Yes. And then that's when you have like the second generation. It's an age, yeah, it's an age thing. My mother, right. my, my mother, who came in you know, as a teenager, uh, said losing her accent was very important. Yeah. And she mm -hmm. ostracized her friends who yeah. still had an accent, even though she was grown up. Mm -hmm. uh, so and so was a greenhorn because, right. you know, it, uh, which is a different meaning in, in New Bedford than yeah. in. Chelsea. Yeah. Mm. yeah, but you can't you can't lose your accent after a certain age. We we know this. Yeah. You know, if mm -hmm. you know after a certain age, your muscles in your face it, it, it doesn't allow that. No. So even though you can speak English perfectly, understand it, read it, you might not you might still have an accent and mm -hmm. will continue to. It's almost impossible after that a certain age. Yeah. Ron? Well, also I think you know we talk about Jewish population for example. Um, there was a, it's totally more complicated. You know, there, there was an attempt to keep, uh, for example, Yiddishkeit going, especially in New York City, where you had the, the how many newspapers yeah. and plays and whatever. So they, they didn't want to lose that. And one of the sad things, I think, for my generation is that our parents wanted to, to assimilate, but we lost something in the process. And some of that is being recovered. You go to the Yiddish uh, Book Center in Amherst, mm -hmm. that's very, you know, trying to revive. So it's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. You want to become American, but you also want to retain what is great about the culture you came from. Right. You know, the thing is, 
all of us have an immigrant background, but many of us, assimilation was the thing to do. Mm -hmm. And then, but for some people, they resent the fact that you have 15 different languages at the elevator, mm -hmm. you know, or we have to have translators in every mm -hmm. particular, and some people resent mm -hmm. that because they remember their grandparents or great grandparents assimilating as quickly as possible mm -hmm. and losing all the cultural things. Mm -hmm. Salad bowl, yes. You know, so that's something that's uniquely American way you were expressed. Hey, my parents had to go through that, so why does everybody else have to, you know, get this, um, get these accommodations, right? Because when we ship, it's, it's been a shift, and we were expected to melt, melt into mm -hmm. American civilization, and now we're being, it's kind of like swung the other way where you want to respect. Except. Except yeah. the um, inclusive of other cultures mm -hmm. because we realize that cultures have their positives and they have their negatives and they can have something to add and something to not have mm -hmm. to. But, you know, that's exactly. what we explain. Because yeah. I come from a farming community which is white, white, white. Mm -hmm. And how many, you know, others in the urban populations right. or gateway cities, that's fine. Right. But they don't get that. They mm -hmm. remember They're living in. They may not know it in Iowa. We do some translation, like at our school. So you get information in Spanish if you're in Spanish, and you get information right. in Portuguese. That, that wasn't always your case. No. You know, for example, for, for me, I would translate for my, my father. Like, I literally would read something. If you yeah. today, he'll call me and he'll say, you know, I have a, some paperwork, can you read through it? Mm -hmm. And I will translate for him. So when we talk about this, I agree with you that sometimes it's not like, yeah, we can assimilate. You know, my father can speak English, but it's some of the things are, are difficult for him to understand. Right. So the assimilation is somewhat foreign. Yeah. And we and have several it's students. Not the goal. It's, it's really I bet thing. your students do the same thing, right? Uh, absolutely. Who, the, yeah, absolutely. The, the kids, you know, even though we send things in Spanish home, they still are explaining it to their parents, and, you know, and, and so there is that is role. In Spanish, right. Or, or English. Or a different shocked. language. Or a different yeah. language, you know. Um, I was very shocked, even uh, three and we do French. They don't, in Massachusetts, they don't have a translation for that. Oh, wow. And that's kind of important. It very yeah. so is. Yeah. So they don't even, they, they don't have the material in, mm -hmm. the, in the, um, you know, in the home language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a Massachusetts document. Right. Which I thought would be. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But if you go to other countries, like when I came to the United States, mm -hmm. I was kind of shocked how much is available in other languages. Right. Mm -hmm. um, in my home country, there isn't that, not that. You, you don't see translations. You go to court, if you don't speak German, then there's nothing available for you. Mm -hmm. Everything official is in German. There's no translation. If you, mm -hmm. You're basically sink or swim. But they do have, the difference I think is they do have a lot more language immersion classes. Mm -hmm. that we do here, yeah. but we don't really have much. No. But you know, it's horrible. You, you'll see signs, like if you're in the supermarket and there's something wet on the floor, then there'll be the sign, you know, in Spanish to watch out. You will never see anything like that in Europe. Mm -hmm. And you look at how many refugees are in mm -hmm. Europe, but there's nothing av available for them. So I was actually impressed, you know, when you dial up a 1-800 number and press one for you know, right, right. Like, wow. At least yeah, there are a few yeah. options. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah true. The nature of, uh, of yes. Society, right? Yes. It's totally different, yeah. It's a different mindset, yes. 
walk on the sidewalks and you know, right? Yeah. I respectfully disagree that the new immigrants don't want to just melt into the mm -hmm. United States. I think it's hard when you are the person to get your generation and, and you come here and you don't speak the language. Mm -hmm. I mean, the kids learn it. Um, they develop American styles and everything else. And if you're in a community where there's a lot of people that are like you, right. the, you know, then the kids can keep the language mm -hmm. about it. You know, if you come from a country and you go into an area where no one speaks your native language, you're going to lose it. Right. Plus, the assimilation in the United States is also political. Mm. I mean, the Irish were heavily discriminated against, but now we have St. Patrick's Day, and no one says, well, what are they doing? I mean, it's America. <laughs> it's right. Catholic. Right. Um, I mean, those things have changed. Yeah. Um, you know, when the, uh, some Scandinavian, not Scandinavian, you know, you know, with the Spanish uh, develop more political power. I mean, certain kinds of their cultural festivals be, be mm. more, mm -hmm. more accepted. Think of the Mayans. Yes, yeah. yes. Plus, look at the name of the Boston Celtics. I mean, Celtics right. is not an American name. Right. Right, and it's a sport, and they feel comfortable enough doing that in Boston, mm -hmm. right, which has mm -hmm. a history. Right. Never mind Native Americans who are <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> exactly. changed our names to become more American. My, my name right now is not even really my name. Mm -hmm. We dropped the O at the end of, uh, you know, Paul, and I became right. Paul. And my middle name changed. My dad added an extra L for our last name. Mm -hmm. And he changed his name. Right. And, and I know people that changed their name completely. A friend of mine, Travis, you know, who I thought was Irish, and his <laughs> last name was Tavares. And I said, why did you change your name? He said, my dad changed it. Yeah. And uh, what I notice today with kids being in high school is that they embrace who they are. Uh, I'll never forget, like, I, I get picked on in school when the teacher would call up my name. Say, Paul Rebello. You kind of hunch over. Can you call me Paul? And she'd say, this is Paula. Mm -hmm. Well, call me Paul. That was a dead giveaway to you Portuguese. Right. And, but today with kids, I'll ask them, do you want me to call you want me to, yeah. your nickname? No. no. Call me by my name. Mm -hmm. That's my name. And I think that's so cool. Yeah. Uh, and it, and it gives me hope that we've, we've kind of progressed yeah. and we're accepting people for who they are. Uh, anyone in here that was around Fall River in the 1970s, you, you know what it was like to be poor. You know, to, mm -hmm. Portuguese people were viewed as just our culture was weird. Mm -hmm. Everything was odd about it. So, you know, that, that feast that you're talking about, that political power, that didn't come overnight. Oh, and that took a lot of time no, to get to that point. What I'm saying, the, the interweaving of Portuguese fabric of the institutions of Fall River over that time mm -hmm. allowed for that to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. And yeah. you acclimate and you know and the, the immigrants that came over, their kids went to school and they, they, they you know became educated and they had kids mm -hmm. and now you know hate to say Again, it, but now there's a new group coming in yeah. that everybody else is like, well they're the new immigrants coming in. Right. And this just happens over time. Yeah. Okay, final comment on this. The question is too, how did they become part of the political system in the young part of the political system here in the United States? Would they have been 
able to become part of the political system in their right. country of origin. Right. They did, I mean, the United States, even if it's taken a long period of time, right. it's given a voice to people that probably even in their own countries wouldn't have had a right. voice. Exactly. I think that's important to remember. It is. Right. I just yeah. like to ask one more comments. The last, you know, item on the illustrator was it's the power of the group to vote. Mm -hmm. So right. you influence politics. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So going back, so thinking about Nazi Germany once again, and again, you can apply this to Otto Frank's letter exactly, and we're going to look at his letter after the lunch break. Um, this is an activity, a lesson from USHMN. Um, I use this in my own classroom early on because, like we said before, that's one of the first questions kids ask. Why didn't they just, that one, and why didn't they fight back? Um, they did. <laughs> so anyway, um, I love this lesson plan. This spells everything out for you. It refers to a video that you can use that's available through USHMN that I highly recommend. Another video, I'm still here, that my kids, today's Friday, they're watching it today. Um, and then you get some stuff about the Evian conference, which we're going to look at. What I like is this part. It's a graphic organizer that they've created. And they have the kids looking at these documents, which are right here. And so again, if you wanted to leave Nazi Germany, it goes through what you have to do. This is as of 1937 or after 1937. And you know, my kids will say, well, OK, passport, yeah, they, that makes sense. But then they get to that second one, and they're like, wait a minute. All right, a certificate from the local police, um, because they're not used to this idea of having to register where you live. Right? I just want to point out, today in Germany, you still have to register. Still. So if you move, say, from one town to another, right. you have, I think, a 10 day that you have to go and register with the police. Your Interesting. Yeah. Really good. Thank so, you for adding that. Because I'm going to let the kids know that. Well, I can look right now. Uh, I think that's still true in most European countries. Yeah. So you have to register anymore. Where it really starts to hit people is there are a lot of taxes. And the amount of money that you can take out is it, it will keep changing. I'm going to show you a graph of that in a minute. Notice that in 1937, it's the last um, little dash, that an immigrant was permitted to take 2,000 Reichsmarks or less in currency out of the country. And your property, the title to your property, goes to the state. Any of that other money above 2,000 Reichsmarks goes to the state, right? Um, you have to turn in, like I was saying earlier, the list um, in triplicate again, before coffee machines, right? A list of all your household goods and their value. Um, again, a list. Um, certification, again, about what you have. So they're very concerned with your property, right, on all of this. Because again, you're not allowed to take most of it. This is a way to, for the, the government to make a lot of money. And then you look at the immigration to get into the United States. Again, birth certificate, that makes sense, a visa, that kind of stuff. But that's where we get into where it gets more difficult. So that affidavit from a sponsor, um, you have to have two people who will vouch for you. Notice they have to have six notarized copies. Right? Um, I looked it up, copy machines didn't start until the 1950s. <laughs> so way before this, right? Um, they had to show their most recent federal tax return. So they couldn't just say, yeah, I'll be responsible for this person. They had to back it up with their bank account and their tax statements to show that I really can. So again, that person doesn't become a public charge. I want to point out that still today. Yes. Um, yes. When I immigrated to this country and I got married to an American citizen, um, he had to provide an affidavit that I was not going to be a charge on the American system, he had to provide tax returns for right. so many years and so forth. So, what year was that? Um, well, I came to the United States in '96, okay. but by the time I came as a graduate student, right. by the time I had to prove that I wasn't taking a job from an American when I worked, yes. that I wasn't going to be, you know, the charge, a right? charge, yeah. Um, and then after getting married, um, so all in all. 
you know, just starting the um, the green card, mm -hmm. or you know, from marriage to green card, it was like seven, eight years. Yeah, yeah, it's a process. It doesn't happen like that. And that's, again, unless our students have been through it or know somebody who has, they don't get that. But I don't think most Americans know that. No, good point, yeah. But the other thing that's interesting in China is the birth certificate. Mm -hmm. The country of birth is determined both. Right. Quotas. Right. Yeah. Because we know how the quota system would change as well, and which countries, you know, when they first right. started. Well, that's 1890, yeah, right. that's the census they used exactly. Yeah, so you, if you were Irish or English, yeah, you, your you odds were, were pretty good. You were down in, yeah. Right. Exactly. I'm not sure how it to Germans back in those days. Uh, it was Germans, Italians, and um, anybody under you know, fascist or, or communist kind of rules of Russia as well. Right, you yeah. have low quotas. Very low, right. right. And you know, so... The issue of the United States never changed it. It right. wasn't a necessity either. Exactly, no, no, that was not shifted. Um, my kids always look at that certificate of good conduct as well, you know, because they're, they're thinking about that and um, <laughs> what that might mean for them, I suppose. But again, you have to do that. Like, I yeah. To sign affidavit that I was not involved in any war crimes, right? Or that I had been involved in any, I that I'd not been a communist party member. I had to sign all of that too. Yes. And they did background checks on me. So that whole vetting process, that's still going right? On. That takes, yeah. And again, the fact that you said it takes so much time. So keeping all of those in mind, again, you could you could do a great lesson having the kids do that activity and then applying it to Otto Frank's letter, right, and showing some of the obstacles that he comes up against. And after lunch, we are going to look at his article, or sorry, his letter again, more specifically. But I want to show you one more testimony. And again, keep this in mind, OK, all of these rules. Because we're going to look at a woman named Esther Clifford. And what unit am I in? I want to be in Nazi Germany. And Esther Clifford is another one, so there's her first one, but I'm gonna play her second one because she's gonna talk about her family trying to get out. Um, she was in Munich, uh, born in 1920. Again, didn't experience life in ghettos or concentration camps. After escaping deportation to Poland, she hid in the homes of family members and later fled to England. Her interview was in the US and she was 18 when the war began. I remember that they t started taking the situation seriously when my father couldn't continue working because then times got very bad. They had a very hard time. They just didn't have enough money to pay their rent, to pay food for food. We all pitched in, but it wasn't enough. And that's when they said that we have to go someplace. And uh, they were always, well, you know, they were, where can we go? Where we, uh, they started going to the American consulate to take out number, a quota number. That was the first thing because they did want to go to America. Very, uh, that was their country. They were thinking of going to Palestine. Um, I don't know why they didn't in those times. Uh, it seemed very hard, but uh, they were hoping to go to to the United States. My brother once brought home a telephone book from New York. I don't remember, he found it someplace. He came home with this heavy book. We have never seen a telephone book like that in our life. And what we did, we were all sitting around that book and looking for Jewish names. Levi, Horowitz, all the Jewish names, Israel. And we wrote, we spent most of the little money that we had writing letters to Americans, begging them to give us an affidavit. You need an affidavit in order to uh, immigrate to America. Uh, you needed a quota number. You needed some. You needed to know someone who would uh, give you an affidavit, which meant uh, uh, putting away a certain amount of money. I think for one or two years, as far as I remember, that's how it was. And so we always said that we will not be. We all have professions, and we told them we can sew and we can do all kinds of things, and. Um, and we begged, and we even enclosed a reply, a, a reply stamp, something like that, so it wouldn't cost them any money. We had a few responses, but no affidavits. 
So we were really, uh, and this went on into 37, we were, but in 37, the situation of uh, getting into it, you could get out of Germany, but it seems that one country after the other closed their doors. They, because meanwhile, the Jewish people, many of the Jewish people had, uh, had gone to other countries and, uh, and I guess many of the countries realized that uh, if they're getting a lot of Jewish people, and uh, I remember it was very hard to go to any place. I remember my mother saying, I, I'll go to the jungle if I could just go any place and just live on bread and water. But it was, we just couldn't go any place. We had no place to go to. I love that testimony. My students really like that one as well. What, what stands out to you on that one with everything we've been talking about? The desperation. That they could get out, but there was no place to go. Yeah. Those do shutting their doors, right? The question I have is why does Germany make it so hard? They didn't like when they didn't want right. to make Germany make it so Well, again, hard to get out. they want their stuff, they want their money. They don't want them to go right. For the right. But they do want them gone. But yeah, they just don't want them to take anything with them, right? So, depending on how you felt about, felt about that, right? Um, and again, think about it in that systematic nature we were talking, when those rules and laws you know, first start developing, eh, I can live with that, right? I have my home, I have my family, I have my job, I have, you know, my kids are in school. To think of going to another country where you have to learn a new language and find a new job and do all of that, that's, that's hard, that's tough. I think too, pointed out that um, a lot of these countries that um, would take immigrants, they didn't want doctors, they didn't want no. lawyers, they didn't want profession. Farmers. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, for a very assimilated people in yeah. Germany, you know, they set up organizations to teach woodworking, right. to teach um, stuffing trades, yeah. all of these sorts of things, so that it would at least give, you know, the potential person a, a the skill that they can use yeah. to get overseas. Um, exactly. And also, too, you had governments that said, we don't want right. uh, more Jewish lawyers, more yeah. Jewish doctors. Exactly. We will only take those that are laboring. Right. And with that, when I, I love the part about the telephone book. Um, I Luckily, my students still know what that is. There's going to be a day. You know it. Um, but they still know what that is. And, and just the fact of, again, in New York City, telephone book, how big that would be, right? And then the painstaking effort of going through that and looking for Jewish sounding names and then writing those letters. And, and I imagine two things. First of all, I, I feel horrible when I think about the hope that they put into that, right? And then on the other end, I'm thinking about that person receiving that letter. You know, it's like when we get the Nigerian Prince emails, right? Like, ugh, what's this? Throw it in the garbage. Right? Or like she said, they got a few responses, but... Or how scary it might be for them. I mean, Maybe. They're, they're dealing with their own immigrant experience. And to have to... If they were, yeah. 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 If they were, right. Mm -hmm. Does your lesson plan at all talk about... I mean, there were organizations that were trying to help. Mm -hmm. quite, some of them were church-related, like mm -hmm. and some mm -hmm. of them were Jewish organizations. Do you touch upon that? Does it work? We'll look at, uh, not specifically, they okay. do look at rescue efforts and, okay. and attempts and such, but they don't specifically at those. Okay. Yeah, but you're right, yeah, there were. The danger, in, and again, not to, to belittle that, because I do talk about that, of course, okay. um, but is that we don't want kids to think, well, there were all these organizations helping, right? So we want to make sure we're balancing that, but yeah, and I don't know that that's why they left it oh, out. Limited, but there, right, but there was something. Some people that tried. Yeah, there was something. Run. No, I'm just thinking how desperate they were. People, you know, we're talking about those in Central America getting more and more desperate. Yes. Same thing. It, it things got worse and worse. Of course, they didn't know not entirely what the final solution was going to be, but they knew that things weren't, mm -hmm. weren't good. And you trying to get out. You exactly. really can't get out because where, the, where do you go? Yeah. And you so, sort of feel that fear. Yeah. And so for the teachers in the room, especially on the USHMM website, they have a really good, um, if you go under for educators, um, 
or you can just, it's easier just to Google. Their website's a mess. Um, but if you Google timeline, USHMM, they have a great timeline activity. And I have it up on my wall, and it takes a huge wall, but I've dedicated one wall to this timeline. And it shows that systematic nature we were talking about has every year, so 33 to 45, and then it has these layers. So you have like victims, you have the laws and decrees, you have the World War II, what's going on, and then you have US and world response. And so I do it, we spend all semester adding to it. Um, when we do a book, we add cards for the book, like when we did night, why is everything here at the end of the timeline, right? And so it just visually gives the kids such a great um, resource. And I keep it up and they can refer to it. Like I said, we add to it. And so I'd really, what you were saying, Ron, with that, of seeing that, okay, this is how it's moving. And so they don't, the, the victims don't see the end of the picture, right? And I, I'm pointing that way because that's where 1945 is on my wall. <laughs> and so I'm always pointing and I'll tell the kids, yeah, okay, she didn't know. They knew they were desperate and they wanted to get out, but they don't know what's going to happen in 1945, right? And they don't know that that will be the end of, of that piece of history. All right, so on that note, it's lunchtime. Um, Ron?